Now, in the remaining minutes, I just wanted to kind of roll the sleeves up, walk together into a clinical practice of patients who have depression. And the modal patient with depression is a patient who's tired, who's lethargic, who is anhedonic, who's often not able to sleep, often of reproductive age, or maybe uh, that may not be relevant if it's male. Uh, and this person is in fact also overweight. And over the years, I've taken an interest not only in this phenotype, but more specifically points of convergence, not just ph phenomenologic, but also neurobiologic, not because it's just simply academic cogitation, but can this provide ways of really providing very new treatments? And, and many might know that we're looking at repurposing anti-diabetics, even drugs for obesity as potential treatments in the future for persons with mood disorders. And, 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 and I mentioned at the start of the program that orexin antagonists are under development by many large pharmaceutical companies as next wave potential antidepressants. So finding these points of convergence is not just an exercise, it is a results oriented exercise that is in the near term, can we find a treatment that's not just different, but a treatment that can target key aspects of people's disturbances that are impairing their overall quality of life and functions. Let's go through some of this if we can. I'm gonna talk a little bit about phenomenological overlap, some, some points of convergence, and just some very practical approaches. So on the exam, what percentage of people with depression have comorbidity? We don't need to convince ourselves it's large. It's over 90% in bipolar, over 70% in depression. And this is <clears throat> this word comorbidity was coined by Feinstein back in 1970. It denotes a discrete pathogenesis. We use the word imprecisely because we don't even know if these are truly comorbidities. I've in fact abandoned the word comorbidity in a lot of the writings that I have, I like to use the word co-occurring syndromes because of the overlapping pathogenesis that we see across various units of analysis from the genetics through the epigenetics all the way up to the CNN, the circuits, nodes, and networks. Now, for me and for you, we often see people who are distracted. I talked about the four A's, raises my suspicion about bipolarity. And we know that these types of conditions are overlapping. And we also know, for example, migraine, a topic I've had an interest in going way, way back. We did a study, oh, 10, 15 years ago with Statistics Canada, reporting that the rate of migraine, of course, is increased in depression, but pop quiz, here's the pop quiz, who in fact is most affected by migraine from a relative risk perspective, major depression or bipolar? The answer, bipolar ranges from 40 to 70% in some studies. In many ways, it's almost considered a, in quotes, bipolar equivalent, end of quotes. In other words, should be getting us a little suspicious, perhaps, that this person may have an underlying bipolar condition. Um, I recall the very first patient I ever seen, uh, saw as a psychiatrist, uh, as a, do my psychiatry rotation as a medical student. I was on a pathway to become a neurosurgeon and the RCMP in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, home of Ann Murray, brought in to the hospital a gentleman who was morbidly obese with bipolar disorder. And I am 25, whatever it is, years later, I'm still studying obesity and bipolar disorder. It changed my life and my career trajectory. It's a fascinating interface. Why, in fact, this is occurring. And simply put, at the brain level, there is, in fact, substrates that are subserving not only the phenomenology of bipolarity, but the disturbances in homeostasis and hedonism that we also now know subserves obesity, ADHD, depression, drug and alcohol abuse, sexual indiscretions, spending indiscretions. And so when asked on the examination, which mental disorder exemplifies most disturbances and reward? We're gonna say bipolar disorder. It truly is the case. And there's been plenty of work to show, again, across different units of analysis. This is looking at, for example, pet measured dopamine receptor expression. Yes, we know it's altered in sleep and obesity and depression, but also in ADHD. So this has been an area of particular interest to us. And there are a number of new treatments that are being developed that are trying to exploit uh, this very knowledge. 
We've said a lot about sleep and pregnancy and treatment resistant depression. Patients don't walk in and say, I have major depression. They walk in and they say, I'm tired, fatigued. I have no joy in my life. I can't function. I'm overweight and I can't, yeah, I, I can't sleep without my weed. Well, what we now know is, is that when you really cascade down into the syndrome of depression, it turns out in fact that body mass index elevation is most associated with cognitive impairment in depression and measures of anhedonia. Of course, we all know we want patients to have a normal weight, but I like to press the point of how obesity metastasizes to the brain through the effectors of immune dysregulation, insulin resistance, as well as disturbances in catecholamine signaling. It's interesting because post-bariatric surgery is associated with a significant improvement in some of these measures of reward as well as cognition. Now we have a drug in Canada, which we prescribe quite commonly at the, <clears throat> at the uh, clinic, Contrave, it's approved in Canada for weight loss. I started doing studies with a guy called Gary Tullison, who was I integral with the fluoxetines um, discovery oh, 15, 20 years ago with this combination. Bupropion's been around since 1969, naltrexone three years earlier. They were combined together to create a weight loss drug, which is one of our go-to agents in our clinic. Um, and what's interesting is that this combination medication, naltrexone, which is a more door and core, a mu, kappa, and delta opioid receptor antagonist, has been shown when combined with bupropion to treat methamphetamine misuse. Is that the focus of today? No, nope. the focus of today is on depression, but depression is a disturbance in reward in cognition. And I thought this really proves the concept strong that in many cases, obesity is a disturbance in craving, it's a disturbance in cognitive control, therefore it's a disturbance in addiction to food. There's a new drug approved two weeks ago in the United States called Libalvi. It's a combination of Samidorphin and Olanzapine. We all know Olanzapine, in fact, we call it, uh, <clears throat> it's, it, as you probably all know, it's a dibenzodiazepine. I call it a dibenzoobesapine because it causes so much weight. But when olanzapine is combined with the 3,4-hydroxynaltrexone drug called samidorphin, that significantly attenuates weight gain liability. So again, my comment is just more this type of excitement in the area of exploiting some of these new receptors is not just academic, it's changing the game. Here's a, a treatment that could help many patients, but unfortunately, the weight gain and metabolic disruption has been a deal breaker. And now combined with an opioid modulator, it could be in many cases, a treatment that could help patients. I mentioned migraines more common. Well, it is. And we also are looking at a variety of drugs that are Health Canada and our FDA approved for migraine that in fact could be helpful for depression. Some of the psychiatrists on, on the call today would say would be saying, I'm starting to yawn. This is an old story because lithium has been well known to be effective in migraine prophylactically. And many drugs that are used to treat migraine even today are conventional antidepressants. So this is an old strategy where we try to repurpose drugs from other therapeutic areas to what you and I are treating. We saw some very practical solutions provided by our speakers in my office. It's fatigue tired, lethargic, cognitively impaired, can't sleep, obese people. And these are the drugs that we typically go with. I don't usually prescribe Orlistat, it's got terrible side effects, but liraglutide and semaglutide, not only are drugs that we frequently prescribe, but guess what? They also behave as antidepressants in our patients. We also use Contrave in combination with our patients, as I mentioned earlier. This is some work from one of our colleagues, Rodrigo Mansour, who in fact made the case strong that liraglutide is a psychiatric drug. It actually is targeting the areas of the brain subserving reward and also areas of the brain subserving cognition. These are similar but different targets to Contrave. Contrave, we know, is also targeting these systems I just previously mentioned. But in the case of Contrave, we have now documented evidence not only of anti-crave, but improvement in hedonistic modulation and cognitive control. Many other drugs are being looked at in this space, the so-called incretins, and you all see lots of patients with diabetes. We see, in fact, these drugs not only regulating weight and sugar, but delaying, forestalling, what's called diabetic encephalopathy. That is the cognitive impairment associated with dysglycemia and insulin resistance, which by the way, 
is why many of our patients with depression who don't have diabetes are cognitively impaired because there's an impairment in their insulin signaling ability. Finally, when managing these issues, yes, we have treatments for our patients, but let's also not forget about binge eat. And binge eat is an interesting construct. It maps onto cognitive discontrol, reward disturbance. It marches in the same direction as bipolarity and ADHD and depression and sleep disturbances. And therefore, it is an absolutely important area to, to probe deeply. And these are some of the areas, some of the drugs that we use to treat this problem in our clinic, notably the stimulants ahead of the SSRIs E.G. fluoxetine. Finally, I just want to leave you, if I can, with the URL. Lots of questions came in with how can I refer people to the CRTC? This is the URL where you can uh, send uh, uh, referrals, and we have clinics in Ontario and also in Montreal. Also, again, a reminder that we have, in fact, the program archived for you on the BCD Foundation website. That information will be sent to you along with some of the answers to questions that we did not get to for uh, today's program. I want to thank the faculty for getting up on this Saturday morning and giving us excellent presentations. I would uh, uh, expect that you'd agree these were not just high quality, but also delivered very professionally and in a way that's highly clinically relevant. So thank you all for that. And again, a thank you to the sponsors who've been with us for a long, long time at BCDF and now with Braxy Institute in providing this information for us as practitioners. And one final remark, that is, don't forget, if you're interested to sign up for the Braxy Institute, not only was it the first ketamine program in Canada, but now the first evidence-based training session for psychotherapy training in people interested in testing the hypothesis that combining psychotherapy with psychedelics could in fact help some patients with depression.